gonna hit you with a hot take right off the rip. It is, at times, a good idea if you play in a dynasty league to hold on, not trade, good players. All right, there's some guys that are on your team that score a lot of fantasy points. The way you win championships in fantasy football, believe it or not, hot take, is by scoring a lot of fantasy points. But value, but value. Fuck your value. I muted the word value on fantasy Twitter years ago. If I've ever used it, then I've muted myself. People are infatuated with the word value. Value don't win you championships. Fantasy points win you championships. There are some players on my dynasty teams that I will not be trading. I don't care what you throw. Yes, if you give me 72 first for Kadarius Tony, I'm rejecting that shit, all right? Don't bring it onto my team page. Don't send me trade offers like that. This is part two of five must keep players on your dynasty team. We did part one. We made a film about it about a month ago. And I hope, I hope for your sakes, because I'm coming to your doorstep. If not, I'm checking your rosters. I'm checking them twice. I'm like, I'm like the Santa Claus of this fucking dynasty trade sheesh. If you've traded any of the five players in the previous video off your dynasty team, get off my channel. Go watch the film first to confirm whether or not you done did it. That'll be linked below. First link in the description. Go watch the first part. Come bike, watch the second part. But before you do so, make sure you tuck your shirt in. Stop yelling. Now listen. Five must-keep players on your Dynasty roster right now. Rookie drafts for a lot of y'all are probably done with. But I do want to know what type of... Because we've been doing rookie content now on the channel between myself and Noah for like two or three straight months. Do you guys want us to continue doing that? Are your rookie drafts all said and done? Do you want us to keep doing rookie content in relation to like dynasty startups? We need some direction from y'all. I'm a blind man behind a car. I don't know where I'm going right now, and I need you guys to give me a push. Rookie content, regular dynasty content, season-long content, gambling content, ASMR content, mukbang content, porn content, water chugging content. <sighs> Whatever y'all want, let me know. I probably won't do it, but just maybe... Just maybe I will. Drop that comment down below. Hit the thumbs up while you're down there. Subscribe to the channel if y'all are new. Let's get to the list. These are going to be a lot more high-profile names. I feel like I actually don't even remember the players I had in the last video. But I think they're a little more under the radar. Guys like, you know, Michael Pittman-ish, Cortland Sutton, those guys. These are a little uh, more obvious ones that I would like to further penetrate the case for. Now, after Melvin Gordon re-signed in Denver... You might be a little bit lower on Javante Williams. That's natural. Of course, you're going to be lower on him in redraft and season long. But I feel like in Dynasty, this should be somewhat obvious. And I think we can all agree when it comes to Javante Williams in fantasy football, his upside, his upside is probably the RB2. As long as Jonathan Taylor is in the league, his upside in a given year is probably the RB2. You don't want to give away players that have that type of upside because upside, that is actually league winning upside, right? It's the same point I made in the previous video. It's all coming back to me. Christian McCaffrey, league winning upside. You don't want to get those guys off of your roster. Javonta Williams is 21 years old right now. I need to repeat that for people out there. He is 21 years old right now. By the time you think he's going to be fantasy relevant, he's going to be like 22.7 years old, which is what a lot of the, a lot of this rookie class is coming in at 23 years old. All right. He turns 22, I think, at the end of this month, or maybe he just turned 22 like a week ago or some shit. He is the youngest relevant NFL running back in the league right now. And when I mean relevant, you that is a stretch. I mean, you basically have I looked at the top 100 ranked running backs in the league right now and he is the single youngest one. I'm not I'm not lying, I'm not exaggerating. He is the youngest out of all of them. He came in the class as the youngest last year. Obviously, some of the incoming rookies are younger than he is, like Brees Hall's young, Isaiah Spiller's young, but anyone that was not drafted in this rookie class is older than Javonta Williams is. So worst case scenario is what we have right now. Melvin Gordon resigns in Denver. Gordon is in the league for another year. It's unfortunate, but you still get peak Javonta Williams in 2023 at the ripe age of 22. And I can't overstate how good this offense is going to be with Russell Wilson. The holes for Javonta Williams is going to be like a game of Connect Four. All right. He's going to get to pick and choose. What hole do I want to fill? He's like the first player fresh 
Connect four box, out of the box. That's what a carry is going to look like for Javonta Williams in Denver. This year, he'll probably be the 1A immediately. I mean, listen, just because Melvin's back does not mean that he doesn't start to see a 60 to 65% share of the workload in Denver. And that's going to be a very, very valuable share piece of the pie there for Javonta Williams. So he is untradeable to me. If I own Javonta Williams, like the shit that you would have to throw into my inbox for me to hit accept, it needs to be like outside of fantasy football. You need to be offering me money, cash, uh, your IRA savings. That's the type of shit that's going to get Javonta Williams off my roster. Nothing less, nothing more than outrageous financial incentives outside of fantasy football. Same thing goes with DeAndre Swift, man. Another guy, to, I'm going to be honest, I was a little hesitant to put him on this list. I'm still a little unbought into the fact that DeAndre Swift will ever be an elite runner in the NFL. But the way the NFL is shaping up, like to be an elite fantasy player is not the same thing as being an elite runner. And it doesn't actually matter. His value is already so damn high. And I think he's maybe someone at a ridiculous price that I would probably let go of. But when you look at the situation, I mean, the, he he's a phenomenal pass catcher. And I think, I think Swift and Eckler are very similar players in what their ceilings can be. And Swift has 10 pounds on Eckler. Maybe not at this point in his NFL career, but if we look at you know their their weigh-ins when they entered the league, Swift is a bigger version of Eckler, and we just saw Eckler pop off for uh, the I believe it was the RB two last year in fantasy. So I don't think anyone's arguing that DeAndre Swift's ceiling is not Austin Eckler. DeAndre Swift also very 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 young, already just had his breakout age, and the thing that excites me the most about his situation, and you might be like, it's the Detroit motherfucking Lions. I know they've been building this thing for a long time, and they are one real quarterback away from being dangerous in this league, man. Chicago's on the downfall. Minnesota will probably be out of the fucking running once Kirk Cousins is out of there. Green Bay, they have one or two more years of Aaron Rodgers, who has no fucking weapons right now. Detroit might be the team to beat in this conf in this division within a year, two years. They're going to be really bad again this year. They're going to get one of the premier quarterbacks in next year's draft, and then this team flips itself on his head. And we want the three down high upside pass catching running back in that offense because I think he rips off a couple Eckler years man where I think we see Swift finish as a top five fantasy running back in you know a two two times in a three-year stretch or two times in a four-year stretch three and a five years you know something like that where he has longevity he has upside he has all the right ingredients to make a perfect margarita all right so DeAndre Swift is someone that I can't get off my team y'all gonna hate me for this one I also wrote this probably about a month ago when I when I actually filmed the first piece, but then we went heavy into rookie content, so I, I haven't really changed up anything here, even despite all the negative press. Kadarius Tony of the New York Giants. Y'all know I, I have a Tony fetish, man. I have a Tony fetish. I love Kadarius Tony. I love Tony Soprano. Tony and fake intern Tony's okay, too. You know, he's 5.7 out of 10. He's just, for me, Kadarius Tony just seems like the... Again, I you know, we'll just keep saying fucking upside. Upside, upside, upside. We I know we saw what he did in one game, two games last year, and a lot of people aren't bought in on that. I'd rather have seen him do that in one game than have a guy that we're holding on to that went like four for 70 in two games. And you're like, oh, he's consistent. He's consistent because his boom weeks weren't as boomy. Fuck up out of here. Kadarius Tony is a guy, he has a different, his upside hits differently than most other guys upside. He's in a different tier than the guys who have small sample size upside. Tony, I, I think it's important to take into context like Tony's rookie year too, right? He hasn't been a guy that's dealt with injuries before. He had like a hamstring pull in college years and years ago. But last year was fluky in my humble ass opinion. I'm only technically a doctor, so take that with a grain of salt. But one of my biggest red flags in redraft in general, not just Tony related, is late summer injuries to a player, uh, specifically lower body, but a lot of times for receivers like shoulder injuries tend to linger into the year. Guys who like pull a muscle, hamstring, calves, whatever, in the later part of August, early September, almost never have a good full season because they rush their return from injury. They're not 100% when they get onto the field. They want to be there for the start of the season. And that likelihood of re-injuring themselves when they go into the year at less than 100% health is so much higher than a guy who steps on the field at 100% health. So no, we can't predict injuries, but we could say with fucking factuality that if a guy steps on an NFL field at less than 100%, he is 100% more likely to injure himself because he's already injured. All right. And that's what we had with uh, Tony stepping into last year. Not only did he deal with COVID in August, right? We, we don't want to talk about that. He had COVID in August, missed a bunch of time in practice. He had a month long hamstring injury in August, right? That didn't subside until September. Big red flag. Okay. Injuries make injuries. It was a fluky injury filled first year 
that I personally saw enough of to believe that if he gets 17 games out of him, which based on those injuries, there's no reason to think he's like an injury prone player. The upside for a guy like Tony is going to be monumental. And it's a guy that I want to see his career play out on my team. I'm not letting go of Kadarius Tony for a damn thing. And yes, he didn't show up to practice. Now he's at practice. They draft Wondell Robinson. I don't give a fuck. When all is said and done, the cream always rises to the top. No matter how much coffee you pour into the mother freaking pot, the cream elevates. There's some factualities for you right there. Damn, I'm on my game right now. This shit is crazy. Yeah. And while we're on an, a random ass topic, I just got an email back from our uh, hopefully new merch manufacturer. We've never been a company. I'm not even pitching you right now. I just kind of want to like talk about this invent, right? We have nothing for sale for you guys to actually buy in terms of what I'm talking about, but little business 101. So we have been in the business of merch for, for a minute and the way most companies operate and the way that we do as well is you go onto our site. Like right now you can go to bdge.store and there's a tab on top that goes to merch and you see a nice like merch page laid out. There's two ways that companies sell merch. Okay. It's through drop shipping and then it's through on hand inventory. Drop shipping is basically you sign up on this website. Um, you could use Printful, you could use a bunch of different uh, type of apps. So there's a lot of drop shipping apps out there where you sign up for this, this app, the software, this website, and they have a bunch of blank pieces of merch on their website, right? Different t-shirts from Hanes and Gildan, whatever, different hoodies, different crew necks, different hats, whatever. They have basically a template and they have a warehouse somewhere in our case, it's like California or some shit that houses eight bajillion pieces of these, this apparel, right? So they have all the, all the t-shirts that they show on the website. They have a warehouse where they physically store like a billion of them because a bunch of companies are using drop shipping and they have this warehouse filled. And what you do is you upload a file, right? We create the logo, whether that's in like Illustrator or Photoshop or just a PNG, whatever. And we upload it to the site and then we maneuver it around on the merch and then we put it up on the website, right? They have this code that like integrates with your website so that it puts their t-shirt on there and it puts our logo file on there. And that's how that drop shipping is done. So you guys order a piece of clothing through our website and that warehouse, that company Printful gets a notification saying Ricky Johnstein in Minnesota traded Kadarius Tony off his dynasty team, cancel order, right? That we actually have that hard coded into our back end. So don't trade him or else you're not getting merch. They get a notification and they do all that work. So they say, okay, we got to uh, find the t-shirt. We've got to print the logo onto the t-shirt. We've got to send it out to Ricky Johnstein out in Minnesota. That's the way dro drop shipping works. It's good and bad. It's, it made, it makes the, the process for us extremely simplified. We don't have to deal with chipping. We don't have to deal with keeping on hand inventory. If you're like a small creator, right? You're probably working out of your apartment or your house. You don't have your rooms and, and shit to uh, stack up boxes of clothing and apparel and shit. So there's upsides and downsides to it. The downside is the profit margin is much lower, right? Because they're doing all that back end work because they're housing everything. The money that you actually make off merch is, uh, there's been times where I've literally run a sale. I'm like 25% off all of our merch and we're like low key losing money. We maybe made like 42 cents on a sweatshirt, some shit like that. So the profit margin way lower. You also get a much smaller selection. You don't choose your manufacturer, right? They give you a selection of Gildan Haynes, uh, next level, you know, five or six different types of different manufacturers that you could choose from, but it's not unlimited. So a lot of the times the quality of these are not uh, up to par, right? And you don't actually get to see what you're sending out. If there's just a batch for whatever reason that smells funky in the warehouse, they might just send that out to your customer. You don't have any like oversight or overlooking towards how they actually operate on those pieces of clothing. So that's the downside. There's upsides, there's downsides. Any like really successful, actually I say this probably naively and unknowingly, because for instance, a company like Barstool sells merch at a wildly high volume. Their, their, the quality of their merch is drop shipping. Like I didn't know exactly what types of merch they use, but they have a lot of merch on hand. And I'm thinking, I, I think they do drop shipping. I'm pretty sure they do drop shipping. Almost any, like if you go to any actual apparel company, like that's what they do as their, their storefronts like that is the, it was like oh we're a merch company we are an apparel company not like we are a media company that sells merch they keep inventory on hand you get to choose your supplier they send you samples you get to to have the right quality and you obviously make a lot more money doing that but you also have to figure out the logistics you have to hold inventory on hand you have to physically package these things you have to print out the shipping labels you have to walk over to usps and ship them shits out to you guys however the quality on that type of stuff is so much fucking higher and you get to hand create those things and that's something i want to be very i am very passionate about i've just not had time to really develop um 
the game plan for it. And we have finally found a manufacturer that I fucking love. The name is Los Angeles Apparel. And uh, we got into their wholesale program. So I'm super psyched about that. And we will have a whole new redesigned merch program for BDG. I just uh, ordered a shitload of blank samples from them. And then I have a friend who's in the fashion industry that's going to come and kind of tell me how the fuck I turn it from a blank sample into the finished product that I could send out to you guys. But there are going to be like these crew necks. There are going to be these hats. They're going to be the uh, the quality for that. You literally won't find better quality at a real clothing store, at a real apparel store. I'm really excited. As you can see, the reason I even went on this tangent was because I got an email back from Los Angeles Apparel with my shipping update of where those blanks are and they should be here by monday may 9th so this was actually probably yesterday we got them i'm fucking excited um this will be by far and away the best merch we've ever had high quality there will not be one single complaint on it i guarantee you anytime we do giveaways you are going to be hyped up to get this this sheesh we're going to have new designs we're going to have uh the, the quality of this merch is going to be wonderful it's also going to be expensive obviously because it costs us a lot of money to actually make it um, but it will be well worth the price. And I'm really, really excited for you guys to actually see it. We'll probably start off the rip with like five or 10 giveaways. Have y'all send in pictures, have y'all send in testimonials. I want video testimonials of how comfy this sheesh is. Okay. That was like 82 minutes in the wrong direction. Let's get bike in the right direction, which is not where the Packers are going, but AJ Dillon himself is going in the right direction. He's another guy with unbelievable upside. We have Rodgers with his new contract, which guarantees A.J. Dillon will be paired with Aaron Rodgers for the remainder of his rookie contract. They have a huge out in Aaron Jones's deal after 2022, and that would save them $11 million against the cap. We will put up cap number up on the screen. They don't have wide receivers on the payroll really anymore with Adams gone. Dylan will still be on his rookie contract, and whoever they draft this year at wide receiver, right? Again, sorry, I wrote this bike in the day. They drafted Christian Watson. Uh, they're going to have to lean on the contract of Aaron Rodgers, okay? Uh, so I think they get rid of Aaron Jones. I think that it is A.J. Dillon moving forward in 2023, and his upside is easily top five fantasy running back type shit, all right? So Dillon's a guy that I need to see, just like Javante. If you got Dillon and Javante, your 2023 running back slots are going to be sexier than Zendaya on the Emmy carpet last year in that green dress. Come the fuck at me. Kyle Pitts is number five on this list, but I want to know who y'all have on this list who are five, three, one must keep player on your dynasty team outside of the 10 I've already named five in the first video, five in this video. Kyle Pitts is number five, but drop that comment down below. Again, if you've enjoyed the video, hit the thumbs up. Let me know if you want a little business intervention in every video. I thought about doing that, but I don't want people to be like, meh, 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 just stick to fuck it. We only talk about, I'm putting football thumbnails up and we're only talking business from now on. Kyle Pitts, tight end Atlanta Falcons. There aren't a ton of tight ends I consider must keep. And to be completely honest, I don't know if there's a single tight end in the dynasty right now that I would put in the must keep category outside of Pitts. I think you can make the argument for Andrews, but personally, like I'd give up Andrews for like a younger, I'd give up Andrews for like Hawkinson in a 2023 first or like Goddard and you know, something like that. Maybe not off the top of my head. I'm just thinking, but Andrews is a guy I could definitely part ways with Kyle Pitts is a guy that there's no, this feels obvious. Like it, it's at, it's a position in dynasty or just fantasy football in general. That's so fucking annoying to fill. And you just got your guy for literally the next 10 years. I mean, you don't even have to think about that position outside of bye weeks for 10 years. Kyle Pitts is so young. I don't even think he's 21 years old yet. This is not even about value or even fantasy points. This is just like peace of mind. Fantasy football season for me, I call it anxiety season. When that first kick registers in week one, red zone goes off. I'm like, fuck, anxiety season has begun. Kyle Pitts is like, is like the Zoloft of fantasy football. He is just a peace of mind player who lets me sit at peace. I have said peace 42 times, but that should that should be my peace on Kyle Pitts. He is the peace of mind Pitts, all right? P-O-M, Kyle P-O-M Pitts. Like you just bought a brand new Jeep Wrangler. You could rip the top off. You live in San Diego. That is Kyle Pitts lifestyle in your fantasy football lineup. But no, your dumbass wants to live in a penthouse in Dubai if, and you're thinking about trading him. Just stop. Just stop the shit. Just enjoy it. Just... Sit down for a moment and enjoy life while you can. Kyle Pitts is going to be 21 in October. Rephrasing that, he will not be 21 until October, okay? He just had the second most receiving yards by a rookie tight end ever. Obviously, he was in 17 games, so whatever, whatever. And realistically, this the crazy part about Kyle Pitts' season, I think anyone who owned him knows this, and anyone who doesn't, 
who tries to peel another narrative is just a fucking asshole. Realistically, this wasn't even a good year for Pitts. It really wasn't. He had three big games against absolutely shit teams, okay? New York Jets, Miami Dolphins, Detroit Lions, terrible defenses. You could sing Miami, Miami. He played Miami in the first half of the season when they weren't going on their win streak. In those three games, all right, he played in 17 games total, right? But in those three games, these stats, he accounted for 100% of his touchdowns on the year in those three games, 38.8% of his fantasy points, 37.4% of his receiving yards, 32.4% of his receptions in those three games against the Jets, Miami, and Detroit. Okay? It's not great for the program, but it's a really obvious sign that once he gets a little bit of consistency going, he's going to be the tight end one for a hot, hot minute. All right? We like to value Kelsey and Kittle and all these guys so highly. When they break out at age 24, 26, and 28, Kyle Pitts just did it at the age of 20. You're getting years of the Wrangler with the top off and no rain. We don't say the car's topless. We say the titties is out. Kyle Titty Pitts. Keep him on your dynasty roster, please. That's number five. So just to wrap up this list, we have Kadarius Tony, Javonta Williams, DeAndre Swift, AJ Dillon, and Kyle. Peace of mind. Titties Pits. I think I had like four other nicknames for him along the way, but I've, I've loved this journey for us. I hope you've enjoyed this video. This video has had a lot of similarities between it or between the guys on this list. All right. They're all young. They all have tremendous upside. It's not about if they've produced yet for most of them. Uh, a lot of them, it's, it's guys that might have been undervalued because they haven't yet broken out or they're coming off an injury season or they've only shown flashes of upside in a game or two games or a month of the season. But those are the guys in Dynasty I like to value because this is like Dynasty is very much like the stock market, man. Most people buy on the dip. Most people sell. Most, most people sell at the dip, buy on the high because they're scared. We don't play scared, okay? We hold on to our best assets through thick and thin because fuck the tax man. That's what I'm saying. All right, I'm out. I hope you enjoyed this video. I love you. Hit the thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. We'll be bike later this week.